Hey, Jeff. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, oh, Ray. That's so exciting. We made it. 52 stories. Unbelievable. In 52 consecutive weeks. Yeah. And so should we end it here? Oh, man, I hope not. But I'm curious, what are we doing out here in the dark? I thought the dark would be the perfect setting to talk about May 19th, 1780, New England's darkest day. Hi, I'm Jeff Belanger. And I'm Ray Osher, and welcome to brrr, episode 52 Yay, of the New England Legends podcast. We did. If you give us about 10 minutes, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. For one year, 52 consecutive weeks, we've been taking legendary listeners like you on a journey across New England in search of monsters, oh. ghosts, ah. aliens, mm. and strange history. What? The response has been amazing, and we appreciate all of you who've been subscribing to our podcast for free on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any of the other podcast services where you can find us. Now you can learn more about us, access all of our past episodes, and learn about the New England Legends television series on PBS and Amazon Prime on our website at OurNewEnglandLegends.com. You can. All right. All right, Jeff, what made May 19th, 1780 so dark? Did something bad happen? Natural disaster, mass murder, what? No, this day was literally dark. The sky turned black, and many in New England believe this was the end of days. We're talking biblical stuff here, Ray. Well, how could that happen? I mean, a solar eclipse, maybe? What? No, no. Eclipses only last for a few minutes. This went on for over 16 hours. Wow. And the cause of this darkness would remain a mystery until just recently. So back then, Samuel Williams, professor of mathematics and philosophy in the University at Cambridge, Massachusetts, documented what he observed, and he published his findings in a 1783 paper he titled An Account of a Very Uncommon Darkness in the State of New England. The time of this extraordinary darkness was May 19th, 1780. It came on between the hours of 10 and 11 a.m. and continued until the middle of the next night. As to the manner of its approach, it seemed to appear, first of all, in the southwest. The wind came from that quarter, and the darkness appeared to come on with the clouds that came in that direction. The degree of darkness arose. In most parts of the country, it was so great that people were unable to read common print, determine the time of day by their clocks or watches, dine, or manage their domestic business without the light of candles. Oh, that's really scary to think that it could be dark in the middle of the day in May. I mean, did this happen just, what, out of the blue? No, not totally out of the blue. Professor Williams described what he saw leading up to that day. In regard to the state of the atmosphere preceding this uncommon darkness, it was universally observed for several days before that the air appeared to be full of smoke and vapor. The sun and the moon appeared remarkably red in their color and divested of their brightness and lucid appearance. This was observed to be the case in almost all parts of the New England states. Well, that sounds like there could have been some kind of volcanic event that blocked out the sun, doesn't it? I'd agree that the smoke and vapor does make it sound like a major volcano, but we can't find a record of one taking place during that time in this region. Well, if the fire was big enough to block out the sun over six New England states, yeah. I guess that would have been a pretty big fire. So Professor Williams went on to describe how by noon of May 19th, it was so dark that the cows returned to the barn stalls on their own. Frogs started croaking as they do at twilight. Even crickets started chirping. The animals figured it was night, just eight hours too early. It was too dark for many people to work, and the scene made a lot of people really uncomfortable. I can imagine. Shoot, I'm getting flashbacks to my Sunday school days when I read Revelations in the Bible. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. Revelations, chapter 6, verse 12. Exactly. What's happening in the skies is right out of Revelations. Professor Williams already described the sun and moon turning red like blood. And then, darkness. I'm reading reports of how some people ran for their churches and prayed like they've never prayed before. <laughs> right. In Salem, Massachusetts, attorney William Pichon noted in his journal that some booze-soaked sailors went frolicking in the streets <laughs> and encouraged the ladies in the street to strip out of their clothes and join them <laughs> in one last round of debauchery before the Almighty strikes them down. I love that. <laughs> well, then there's this badass story out of the council chambers in Connecticut, where they found the sudden darkness unnerving and called for the meeting to end. But a Connecticut militia colonel at the meeting protested. 
He said, I am against adjournment. The day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause of an adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. I wish, therefore, that candles may be brought. Councilman Abraham Davenport. I love that go-down swinging attitude. So that evening, the people of New England saw darkness unlike anything they had ever seen before. Samuel Tenney of New Hampshire said it was as dark as before the Almighty gave birth to light. He said if a person were to hold a white piece of paper just a few inches in front of his eyes, it was equally invisible with the blackest of velvet. That night, as you can imagine, few people slept very well. No one in their lifetime had ever seen anything like this. At some point, it's impossible to think of anything other than final judgment. I mean, folks were scared. But then, something happened. The sun rose again the next morning. The sky was hazy but it was no longer black. The aftermath of this event is really interesting. Professor Williams documented all of the various theories that were put forth by supposedly learned men. Some believe it was the transit of the planets Venus or Mercury. Some said it must have been a meteor strike or some kind of unusual solar eclipse. Then some of the theories got a little more metaphysical. What do you mean? While the Revolutionary War was raging during this time, right. some claimed the darkness was a sign from God, you know, some kind of warning. Right, but a warning to who? The, the British or the rebels? Well, I guess you could interpret the sign either way, depending on your political position. You said earlier that they recently figured out what caused this. And of course, the bigger question is, could it happen again? Well, yes, it could happen again. Back in 1780, Professor Williams believed that the darkness was caused by forest fires that must have burned somewhere in the vicinity because people reported smelling burning leaves and there was a soot-filled rain. Well, that makes sense. How was Professor Williams' thesis received? It wasn't. (laughs) He was pretty much (laughs) scoffed at. Sure, I guess God being angry over the American Revolution makes a little bit more sense. It's a funny thing about faith, Ray. The faithful always need a sign of some kind to support their beliefs. Mm. Even if the sign is scary or negative, like God blocking out the sun, it's still an affirmation that they're on the correct path. But who wants to be right about the end of days, you know what I mean? (laughs) Right. I mean, what good is it to say, I told you so? (laughs) When fire and brimstone are falling from the sky and destroying everything. True, but that wouldn't stop some people. So how was the definitive cause to New England's darkest day discovered? Some folks at the University of Missouri believe they found the answer. They're smoking gun. Oh, really? A smoke pun? <sighs> Sorry. Okay, here's a copy of their findings. All right, so this was published in 2007. Right. That's 227 years after the fact. Good math. It's, thank you. It says that researchers at the University of Missouri discovered signs of a massive wildfire that took place centuries ago in the Algonquin Highlands of southern Ontario. Between fire scars and counting rings on the trees, they could date the fire back to the spring of 1780. Combine all that smoke with already cloudy skies, and you've got biblical darkness. Mm. Before the days of internet, broadcast, and reliable news, each community was left to interpret this frightening phenomenon as best they could. Even when there's a natural explanation like a massive forest fire, that doesn't stop many people from looking for a bigger meaning, you know, trying to make order out of the chaos. Maybe the darkness served to correct the moral compass of the masses just a little bit. We sometimes need a not-so-subtle warning that as smart and strong as we think we are as a species, Mother Nature could still take us all out with just a flick of her wrist. Well, just as the sun came back after the darkness, so too will the New England Legends podcast. Nice. It's been one year of stories every week. Amazing. And I know. we love the fact that legendary listeners like you have been telling us about legends and stories that you've heard. Please keep them coming in our Facebook group, on our website, or call or text us on our legend line. And the number is 617-444-9683. We got a voicemail this week from the 508 area code. Nice. That's Massachusetts. Wishing us a happy one-year anniversary. Hi, it's Chrissy from Upton, where the cool chamber is. Just wanted to give a shout-out for your first birthday. Happy birthday, New England legends. Good job, Jeff and Ray. Have a good one. Thanks, Chrissy. We'd like to thank all of you legendary listeners for a great first year. We can't wait for you to see and hear what we have in store for our next 52 episodes. We're on a mission to chronicle every legend in New England, one week and one story at a time. We'd like to thank Michael Legge, Dave Schrader, and Tim Dennis for lending their voice acting talents this week. And our music, of course, is by John Judd. Until next time, remember, the bizarre is closer than you think. Closer than you think.